Hello there everyone. So, in today's video, we're going to continue to discuss the Sega Dreamcast. If you missed last week's video, which was a general dis discussion about the entire story of the Dreamcast for its 20th birthday, where I covered everything from its launch to its discontinuation and everything in between and after, you should probably watch that video first because, in general, it just discusses more about the system. This video is going to be focusing on one specific question about the Dreamcast. Namely, why did the Dreamcast fail? How did this system, with such a great launch, fall from grace more than two, less than two years later into its global life? Well, unfortunately, there are many reasons for this. And I'm going to try and cover as many as possible in a reasonable amount of time. So without further ado, let's get into it. So first of all, in my opening I said that the Dreamcast had a great launch, but that's only partially true. If you remember from my first video on the Dreamcast, I described both the North American launch as well as the Japanese launch. The North American launch was incredibly successful, so much so that many consider the Dreamcast North American launch to be one of, if not the best console launch of all time. However, the Japanese launch was nowhere near as successful or memorable. It released almost a whole year earlier than it did in the rest of the world and was nowhere near as well received as its worldwide launch. Sega's previous system, the Saturn, was pretty much a failure worldwide. But the one exception to that is Japan. The Saturn saw decent success in Japan. Not monumental, like not as successful as like the PlayStation or anything like that, but it saw decent enough success. So when the, wa so when the launch of the Dreamcast came, it seemed to be premature and rushed to the Japanese market. Basically, by releasing the Dreamcast when Sega did, they essentially left a bad impression in the Japanese market. Therefore, Sega sort of crippled their chances of the Dreamcast being successful in that market before they even began to sell it. For a console to be successful, it needs to be accepted in all three of the major markets for gaming, thus being North America, Europe, and Japan. They're the biggest regions for gaming, and for a system to be taken seriously, it definitely needs to release in all three of them. But for it to be really successful, it has to be accepted in all three of these regions. There is, again, one exception, which is the Xbox brand, which is a success in North America and Europe, but it's a complete failure in Japan, and it always has been, and likely always will be. But by getting off on a bad start in the Japanese market, that definitely aided in the downfall of the Dreamcast. But that's far from the biggest problem with the system, unfortunately. So what about America, then? The system was incredibly well received at launch by consumers. And critics alike. But what happened afterwards? Well, simply put, the PlayStation 2 happened. That was honestly the biggest factor in the downfall of the Dreamcast. The PS2 was more powerful technologically in most aspects, while being priced at $300. Now, you see, that was bad enough for the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast was $200, the PS2 was $300, so the Dreamcast still seemed like the better option, you would think. But what truly put the PS2 ahead in most customers' minds was the fact that the PlayStation 2 was capable of playing DVD movies. Now that might seem laughable now because everything can play DVD movies and you can buy a DVD player for, like, nothing. Like, they're incredibly cheap. But back in 2000, getting a DVD player for $300 was great. Like... You didn't get that. Add on to that the fact that it was also a fully-fledged game console made by Sony, who were the most successful in the previous generation, and it was pretty much the best deal of all time. Nobody could stand up to that. Nintendo tried and Microsoft tried later with the Xbox, but neither could even come close to achieving the PS2 success. And the Xbox even had a DVD drive as well. But there was also the problem that faced the Dreamcast, that a DVD disc, which is not only the movie format that the PS2 used, but it was also the format that game discs came on, for the most part. There are blue discs of PS2 games, which are CD-ROMs instead of DVD-ROMs, but that's besides the point. A DVD could hold up to 8 gigabytes of data if it's dual-layered, whereas Sega's proprietary format for the Dreamcast called the GD-ROM, which I discussed more in depth in my last video, could only hold 1 gigabyte of data. Had the Dreamcast opted for the DVD drive instead of a GD-ROM drive, the story of the Dreamcast may have been different. Although it's important to keep in mind that having a DVD drive, especially back then, would have been expensive, 
and probably have increased the system price by about a hundred dollars so you could consider that a downside however i feel like having a dvd drive would definitely have helped the dreamcast more than it would have hindered it because it would have had even if it's worldwide launch still almost a year's time before the playstation 2 came out and if it was a cheaper dvd player made by sega who weren't as loved as they were but they were still a well-known name with the genesis that could have Change the entire story, honestly. Although, there are more problems. That is, some people consider that the biggest problem, but there are definitely a couple more problems. So, one of the, another one of the smaller problems, which, it might not seem like a problem at first, but when you stop thinking about it, it definitely didn't help matters. There's also the fact that, since the Dreamcast had such a successful launch, worldwide, mainly due to having so many great games at launch, the price, wa the price was there was no real huge anticipated games coming out. Well, I mean, if you think about modern systems, most of the time there's a big game that everyone's looking forward to coming out, whether it's third party or first party or whatever. There's something coming out that's keeping you interested in that console, making you not want to, like, move away from it. Or there's an exclusive on another console you don't have that's driving you to maybe purchase that one. With the Dreamcast, it had a very small library, and you can tell based on the first half of the year 2000. Don't get me wrong though, there were a lot of great games that came out, such as Crazy Taxi 2, Jet Set Radio, and of course Shenmue, along with many more that I'm not mentioning here, but there are, there are more, it's just not massive hit after massive hit after massive hit. But due to this phenomenal launch, the period between basically launch and when Shenmue launched, seemed like a bit of a dry spell in hindsight. So because of this, I don't believe sales were as high as they could have been. I think had Sega spread their content more, wide, more widely, like in that gap, they could have had more people interested. Although then you wouldn't have had such a successful launch, so it's, it's kind of like 50-50, it's like... You might have been better off, but you might have been better off doing what you did, but you might have been better off doing something else. It's like, who can say? But next we're going to talk about probably one of the biggest factors in the downfall of the Dreamcast. And it's something I think we've discussed more times than... This isn't the first time we brought it up. Sega's overall reputation. Now, Sega was a huge success in the early 90s with the Genesis slash Mega Drive. But the mid-90s was a completely different story. Sega seemingly didn't know where to go after the Genesis, and they had immense difficulty moving on. Their first plan for the next generation was a traditional next-gen home console, which would later become the Saturn. But for whatever reason, they instead created the 32X, history's most infamous add-on and usually considered the single thing that killed Sega. Years before they stopped making consoles, everyone seems to attribute the 32X for it. And to, uh, to a certain degree, they're not wrong. 32X definitely did not help anyone. But if you think about it, the, the reason they probably released the 32X is because of how successful the Genesis was in North and South America as well as Europe. But this might be surprising to anyone who, like, you know isn't from Japan. The, the Mega Drive wasn't a huge success in Japan. It came third place out of the three main consoles, first being the Super Nintendo and second being the PC Engine, which did release in Europe and North America under the name of TurboGrafx-16, but it was nowhere near as successful here as it was in Japan. Explosive hit in Japan. It was amazing for them. So, therefore... The story of the 32X goes this way. Before we get into that though, we can't really confirm this story because there's a million different stories for the origin of the 32X. I think it's mostly because nobody, you know, no one wants to be responsible for the thing that stops Sega making consoles. Nobody wants to be responsible for this horrible failure. But the most common version of the story goes like this. Basically, Sega of Japan told Sega of America 
to create the 32X due to the overwhelming success of the Genesis in North America. And Sega of America released it reluctantly, but ultimately had no choice because Sega of Japan is the parent company. But Sega is a Japanese company. They get, they get the first say. They, have, they say what happens, and then Sega of America and Sega of Europe have to follow suit. That's just how it is. So, like I said, there are there is no concrete evidence of this story being true. It's just one of the most common stories out there. And there are other versions. For example, there's a version which is basically the opposite, in which Sega of America persuaded Sega of Japan to let them release the 32X because of this Genesis of success. Genesis is... <laughs> but then, but then they later were told by Sega of Japan to release the Saturn because the 32X wasn't being supported by Sega of Japan, so they discontinued it. But anyway, that's the first story I told you. Seems to be, seems to me to be the first source I would go to. That would be the first story I'd say if anyone asked. That seems to be the most. That's that one makes the most sense. But anyway, getting back on topic here. The 32X was horribly received worldwide, complete failure, and it was quickly abandoned in favour of the Saturn, which was the right decision. But due to what they'd done with the 32X, the Saturn left a terrible impression in customers' minds as well. For a couple of different reasons, again. You see, the Saturn was also a failure worldwide, like the 32X. Not as bad as the 32X, but it was... It was, as far as a console success, it's not good. It was definitely not successful. The launch is possibly the worst console launch in history. Basically, they planned for a November launch of 1995. I think, it, yeah, it's 95. Which is when the PlayStation was coming out. But Sega noticed that the PlayStation would be far more capable than the Saturn in its current state. So Sega did two things which hurt them badly. Firstly, they put a second processor into the Saturn. Now that might seem like basic, super easy technology to us now, but back in but back in those days, no game developer knew how to work with a second processor. It basically just sat there and did nothing the whole time. The Saturn was built to be a 2D focused console with 3D rendering capabilities. The PlayStation was built to be a 3D game system that had much more capabilities in 3D gaming because that was the future. But Sega didn't plan for that, so they put a second processor in, hoping that developers would figure out how to use it and make games work on it. That never happened. The Saturn's kind of like the, the like past version of the PlayStation 3. Except it never had the huge comeback story that the PlayStation 3 does. It's like it was too complicated for developers to work on. And it also put the price way higher than the PlayStation. In fact, the price of the Saturn was like $400. And at E3, where the PlayStation 1 was like shown off and announced, the guy who introduced it, instead of doing this huge speech that he prepared, he walked on stage and announced the price. He just said $299, walked off stage. Huge applause. Because the Saturn was so much more expensive. And it really didn't have any reason to be. Based on what came out for it. Most people would consider the Saturn to not be worth the money that Sega were asking. So they had put in that second processor which screwed over developers. And they put the price right up which screwed over consumers. But the other thing they did. As well as changing the architecture of the system. Really close to the intended release date. They jumped the release date forward to May of 95. Games weren't ready. Developers have been told they had a certain amount of time to get games ready so that they'd be ready for a November launch. Retailers have been told, get ready for a November launch of 95. And then at E3, they'd go on stage and say, guess what? It's available right now. Go buy it. And everyone's like, what? Nobody understood because... Developers hadn't finished their games, so you famously got versions of games that were shipped broken and glitchy and a complete mess that later got re-releases to fix the bugs because they weren't finished in time, but they had to be ready because Sega told them. Because Sega's first party studios had no choice, they had to do what they said because they were hiring them. So, that was it. 
The Saturn ultimately left a horrible, horrible taste at launch. But it gets worse for the Saturn. I swear, Sega basically, they didn't want to do the Saturn. It feels like they didn't want to move on from the Genesis in any way. But they had to, and it seems reluctant, and it was a failure because of that. But it get it does get worse for the Saturn. I discussed this in my previous video, talk about the Dreamcast. And it's basically where Bernie Stoller, president of, Saturn, president of Sega at the time, told the world in an interview, the Saturn is not our future. He told everyone not to buy a Saturn. In, for most of 1998, Sega basically didn't have a game console. The Dreamcast came out at the end, Japan only. But nobody was buying a Saturn because Sega basically said, don't bother buying a Saturn, we're doing something different. And that is the second time in a row they had burned customers like that. So, understandably, consumers weren't looking forward to what was coming next until it was, like, hyped and hyped and hyped up for a whole year. But, I mean, if you get burnt like that two times, like, the 32X was $150 and discontinued within a couple months. The Saturn was $400, never lived up to that price tag for most people, and was discontinued essentially at the end of 97. It still existed and wasn't discontinued until I think 99, but it might as well be discontinued in 97 because all that it got was a couple sports games at the end. That, you know, the usual stuff that a system gets when it's on its last legs. That's what it got. So, basically, the point of that story is to say both of these systems essentially destroyed Sega's public image and gave them a huge disadvantage going into the Dreamcast. And that definitely, definitely damaged their chances of success. Had the 32X not existed, the Saturn might have had a better chance, which, made, which would have made the Dreamcast journey into the video game market far easier. But, you know, we can't really say that because we can't say it for certainty. We can say it and think it would probably be true because it would make sense in some aspects. But they got to realize that Sega mucked up so much with the Saturn. I feel like had they not released the 32X, they probably wouldn't have jumped the launch of the Saturn. They probably released it at a reasonable time and they wouldn't have spent all that time developing the 32X. They had more time to focus on the Saturn. Maybe harness that second processor and make it work, or develop a better processor capable of 3D graphics. But they didn't. They released the Saturn in, its, in the state that we got it, and it didn't do well. And, obviously, if it had more time, more games would have came to it, more customers might have bought it, and then Bernie Stoller wouldn't have said Saturn is not our future. So, I really do think the 32X is one of the biggest problems that caused the Dreamcast's failure. But as for why it failed so early in its life, we're gonna to get to the last point here, which is the core problem of the Dreamcast failure. This problem isn't something that Sega necessarily did. More so, it was essentially the result of all the other problems I've discussed so far. Sega just simply ran out of money to support the system. Through essentially two failed consoles in a row, and a third failing console in the Dreamcast, Sega had fallen into huge financial troubles by the time that they had to discontinue the Dreamcast in March of 2001. As they were only a multi-hundred million dollar company, which for a company that was the size of Sega, that was absolutely horrible. And that put them on the verge of bankruptcy. Which led to Sega unfortunately having no choice but to discontinue the Dreamcast and become a third party developer until the present. So... That's basically the story of the Dreamcast's failure. Through bad decisions on Sega's end, the more powerful PS2 being announced shortly after the launch of the Dreamcast, as well as the GameCube and Xbox being announced shortly after, although they didn't really have much impact on the Dreamcast because by the time those two systems came out, the Dreamcast was already discontinued. The Dreamcast had a very hard battle ahead of it, and unfortunately, it lost. However, there is an upside to this whole story. Since the Dreamcast is and was so loved by those who had it, there's still a community that's incredibly passionate about supporting the console. So much so, in fact, that new games still come out for it 20 years 
after it was launched. 18 years after its discontinuation. Not even the absurdly successful PlayStation 2 can claim that it's still getting support like that. With its final game coming out in 2014. Some sports game, I think it was like Pro Evolution Soccer or FIFA 14 or something. But, therefore, while the Dreamcast undeniably failed in its commercial lifespan, it now receives a lot more love than it ever did in that short time. And I think it's very much deserved. So, that's that video basically. Thank you all so much for watching. I really hope you all enjoyed this. Stay tuned for next week's video where we will be doing the last video of, I guess you could call it Dreamcast month. <laughs> I guess you could call it that. Next week's video will be the last video talking about Dreamcast for a while unless some major news comes out on it. So if you're sick and tired of hearing about the Dreamcast, that'll be good for you. But next week, I'll be discussing what I believe to be the top 10 best games for the Sega Dreamcast. I'm only going to be including games that came out during its commercial lifespan from 98 to 2001 because I've not played any of the homebrew stuff and not everyone has access to that stuff as easily. So we're going to be covering the top 10 games that came out during its relevant lifetime in the gaming market. So I hope you all look forward to that video coming out sometime next week. Yeah, I'm really sorry about the random upload schedule recently. I just started university. I'm still trying to get used to that. But I assure you that content will still be uploaded regularly and weekly, hopefully, so long as there are still people who want to watch it. So once again, thank you for all the continued support, and I'll see you all next week. Goodbye.